But here is work and energy part three. We're going to do some problems. So let's look at a couple of problems. Let's see. Let's do the first one. A bow has a spring constant of 30 newtons per meter and it is stretched 0.6 meters. If an arrow is loaded that has a mass of 0.88 kilograms, how fast does it go when it leaves the bow? How high could it go? All right, so this problem's fairly uh, straightforward. We don't, we're still gonna put up the conservation of energy equation, but, uh, but let's first start with listen what we know. What do we know? We know for the bow, there is a spring constant. Bear with me one second. There is a spring constant of 30 newtons per meter. And that bow is stretched 0.6 meters. <clears throat> Those are both for the bow. And then we have the arrow. The mass of the arrow is 0.88 kilograms. I'm going to put that off to the side. Now let's write out the whole uh, conservation of energy equation. Um, if we remember, we're looking at this. So I'm just going to rewrite this again. And for this problem, there's only, you know, we're only changing from one type to another each time, but that's okay. So we are going to have uh, gravitational potential energy initial plus spring potential energy initial plus kinetic energy initial plus any work in. And that's going to equal some amount of total energy. So let's look at this for a second. There's a few ways to look at this, but uh, but let's go ahead and get started. So we have this bow, and we're assuming this is the lowest point, right? The, the arrow, the bow, <coughs> excuse me, the bow is getting pulled back, has an arrow in it, and then we're going to fire it up because we're looking at how high it can go and how fast it's going to go. So we're assuming we're firing it up, not down. So it's at its lowest point now. So I can get rid of initially gravitational potential energy. Again, I understand that it's probably not on the ground, right? But as far as we're concerned with this problem, the arrow is going to do what? The arrow is going to start here, and it is going to fly up to a highest point, right? So it's at its lowest point now. So we're not trying to figure out, is it the lowest point ever possible? We're trying to figure out, is this the lowest point of the problem? There is a spring, so I know that there's spring potential energy. So really, I'm going through this, and I'm just seeing what types of energy do I have? What types of energy do I not have? I'm at the lowest point, so I'm going to say, you know what? I don't have any gravitational potential energy. I don't have any useful gravitational potential energy. Um, I have a spring, and I know I do because I have a spring, and it is stretched. Um, before I let go of the bow, it's not moving. So initially, there is no speed. Yeah, there's going to have speed later. Um, and then is there work? And this is the tricky one, right? Um, we could argue that the bow is going to do work on the arrow. Work will be done. We could absolutely make that argument. It's going to apply a force and make the arrow move, right? So, so we can definitely make the argument that work is being done. But how much work is going to be done? Well, the amount of energy that the bow has is equal to the amount of work that's being done. So we're not going to solve it both ways. Then we're assuming we have twice as much energy um, than we really have. So I'm either going to calculate how much energy is stored in the bow, or I'm going to calculate the force times the displacement on the arrow. But again, when we talked about in the last video, if you're talking about force times displacement, the bow doesn't supply a constant force. So it's a hard calculation to do, right? We'd have to deal with a force that's constantly changing. Um, so it's much easier for me to just to say, you know what, I don't know how much work the bow is going to do on the arrow. I'm not, I don't know the force and the displacement um, for the for the that the arrow is going to receive, but I can calculate how much energy is going to be stored in the bow, and all that energy is going to go to the arrow anyways. So this would be a case where I've got to solve it one way or the other, but the easier way to do it is to calculate the potential energy of the spring, and that's just going to equal the total energy. So as I do this, spring potential energy equals one half kx squared. And notice, I don't really care about the arrow when I do this calculation because the energy is being stored in the bow. If I didn't have an arrow in it and I took the bow and I pulled it back 0.6 meters, it still has the same ability to do work. Whether it does work or not, it still has the same ability. So all I really care about is the bow when I'm looking at it this way. What is the bow doing? How strong is it? 30 newtons per meter. And how much do I stretch it? 
0.6 meters. So we do this twice. Look at my units. This meter is going to cancel out this meter. So I'm going to be left with Newton meters or I'm going to be left with joules, right? I'm going to have Newton meters, which is the same as a joule, which works out to be 5.4 Newton meters or 5.4 joules. So there is 5.4 joules of energy in the system initially, which is my total energy. I have a total energy of 5.4 joules. That's what I have. Now, I'm going to erase my calculation for this. Hopefully you see it, though. Um, and let's keep on going. So now I want to see if I can answer the other two questions, which is how fast is it moving when it leaves the bow? And how high does it go? I'll leave my diagram for now. Um, and as I look at this, right, when it leaves the bow, it's right here, right? It has just left the bow, and that's the fastest speed it's going to go. Well, if I go through all of these, um, so all of this equals gravitational potential energy final plus spring potential energy final. Hopefully you understand what I'm saying more because my writing is getting pretty sloppy. Plus kinetic energy final plus work out, and let's fix this, that's a plus, and that also equals the total energy, right, that equals this, so I know how much energy I have, I have 5.4 volts, and if I'm talking about the arrow just as it leaves the bow, well, it still hasn't had time to get a height yet, so the gravitational potential energy is still zero, right, it's still right at that starting point, just starting to go up, the bow's done giving its energy to the arrow, so there is no more spring potential energy. Um, the arrow's not giving away its energy through work. It didn't hit anything and give energy to that. So all, all I have is kinetic energy, and I have 5.4 joules of kinetic energy. So I'm looking for how fast is it going. So I'm looking for a speed. So let me write up my other equation. Kinetic energy equals 1 half mv squared, and that has speed in it. So I'm going to multiply both sides by 2. Divide by m, so it's going to be 2 times the kinetic energy divided by the mass equals speed squared. And then to solve for speed, I'm going to have to take the square root of both sides. So speed is going to equal the square root of 2 times kinetic energy divided by the mass. <coughs> Excuse me, let's do this out with some unit analysis. 2 times the kinetic energy, and the kinetic energy is going to be 5.4 joules. And you know what? Just to make this a little easier on me, I'm going to say a joule. A joule is a kilogram meter squared per second squared. And I'm going to write it out with its base units instead of newtons. And then we're dividing by mass, and the mass is 0.88 kilograms. I'm going to do it this way so I could see if I'm doing this right. And as I look at this, Kilograms cancels out kilograms. I have meters squared over second squared. Well, the square root of meters squared is just meters. The square root of second squared is just seconds. So right there, I've done my units right. So I know that this is going to work out okay. Now I just have to do the math. 2 times 5.4 divided by 0.88. Take the square root. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, that's fine. <clears throat> and this is not a very powerful bow. This arrow is leaving with a speed of 3.5 meters per second. And there we go. So the spring potential energy that I had turned into kinetic energy. I keep going. It doesn't really matter which one I use, but I'm just going to stick with what I have here for initial. But to be honest with you, at this point, I could say that the kinetic energy is my initial. Right? Wherever I pick is actually kind of fine. Um, but let's do the last one. How high could it go? So now we're looking at the height of this, and again, if I go through all of them, gravitational potential energy final, plus spring potential energy final, plus kinetic energy final, plus work out. Well, there's still no work being done on this, so I can get rid of work out. At its highest point, does it have gravitational potential energy? Yeah, if I fire this um, arrow straight up in the air right at this high point, that's when it does have a height. It does have gravitational potential energy. So that's in. Um, 
the bow's done still, right? It's fired the arrow, so it's not, it doesn't have any energy stored in it anymore. And at the highest point, the speed of the arrow is zero. So now I could say that the gravitational potential energy equals the total energy. Um, so then I can say that <clears throat> the potential energy due to gravity, and I know how much I have, I have 5.4 joules equals mgh. I'm solving for h, I'm going to divide both sides by mg. So gravitational potential energy divided by mg equals h. So again, I'm going to break it down to its base unit, 5.4 kilogram meter squared per second squared, divide by m. So I'm dividing by 0.88 kilograms. I'm going to divide by g, 9.8 meters per second squared looking at my units let's see kilograms are going to cancel out second squared are going to cancel out i have one on the bottom for meters and two on top so one of the meters is going to disappear i'm going to get an answer in units units of meters which tells me that i'm doing it right again because it's a height and how does height measured height's going to be measured in meters so here we go 5.4 divided by 0.88, divided by 9.8. How high would this arrow go? It's not going to go very high. This is a lousy bow with the numbers I use, but that's okay. Um, it's going to go 0.63 meters into the air. So it's barely going to leave the bow. Um, but there we go, right? We figure out our initial energy. That's got to equal our, our energy right when it leaves. And then that's got to equal the energy at the highest point, right? We have 5.4 joules of energy to work with. And the only way for there to be more energy in this system is if somehow in the flight something does work on the on the arrow, which doesn't make any sense. Um, and the only way this loses energy is if the arrow, when it hits something, does work on that something, which could be the ground, could be something else. I don't know what it is, but it's the only way that we gain or energy, gain or lose energy in this system if there's some work that's being done. All right, so moving back. That is our first question. Second one, we're going to draw a picture, so we're going to look at a roller coaster. Let's go ahead and clear some of this. And let's say we have a roller coaster, and let's say this roller coaster starts on the bottom of a hill. And I don't know much about the bottom of the hill, but then it goes like this, and it goes like this. And I'm going to say at this moment in time, much like many roller coasters, when you get to that first hill, it's not going very fast. It's barely moving. So I'm going to say at this point, the velocity is zero. It's at that very top roller coaster hill, and it's just about to fall. And I'm going to give it a mass. And to be honest with you, I don't know how much the mass matters, but it, well, it matters in some cases. It doesn't in others. I'm going to say that this is 250 kilograms is the mass of this car with the people in it. And there's only a couple people in it, right? And let's see. The height of this first hill, let's say it's 25 meters high. So that's what, roughly, it's roughly eight, nine stories, somewhere in there. Um, then it's going to go down. And here's where I'm going to start asking questions, right? When the roller coaster is at the bottom of this first hill, back to ground level, what is the gravitational potential energy? What is the kinetic energy and what is the speed? So we're going to ask all that for this spot. And then later on, we're going to give this a little more information. We're going to add two more parts of this, but let's, uh, let's look at this one. At this point, what is the height? What is the gravitational potential energy? And what is the kinetic energy? And we'll give a little more information when we get there. Um, <clears throat> All right, but let's look at this first one. So we look at this situation <clears throat> and we could say, okay, for the first part, gravitational potential energy plus spring potential energy plus kinetic energy plus work in equals our total energy. So we start looking at this initial situation, which is here. And we're even going to back up and go before that, but let's just look at this situation right here. Like I said, well, it has a height, so it has gravitational potential energy. I don't see any springs, so there's no spring potential energy. It's not moving yet. It's going to start picking up speed as soon as it falls. And there's nothing doing work on it right now. 
So the gravitational potential energy equals the total energy in this in this case. And let's go ahead and just calculate that. Um, gravitational potential energy equals MGH, so it equals 250 kilograms <clears throat> times 9.8 meters per second squared times a height of 25 meters, which isn't unrealistic. So how much total energy do we have? 250 times 9.8 times 25. Works out to be 61250 joules. That's how many joules we have, or we could say it's kilograms meters squared per second squared, which is a joule. So this is how much energy we have at the beginning. Now, <clears throat> if we back up a little bit, how did it get that energy, right? How did it end up having 61,250 joules of energy? Well, the quick answer is something did work on this car, right? And that's usually some some big motor that's got a chain, right? And the chain attaches, attaches to the road coach and it brings it up. So how much work did that motor do? Whatever it was, the mechanism that got this roller coaster to the top of the hill? Well, what that motor did, 61,250 joules of work on it. That's what it did to bring it up that high. Do I know how much force it applied? Well, I can get, I can actually start to figure this out if I wanted to because I know <clears throat> work equals force times displacement, and the displacement is 25 meters. So I could figure out an average force that it applied. It's no one set force, but I could certainly fit, figure out an average force if I wanted to if that was part of the question. Um, but it's not really part of the question. I was just saying work had to be done to give the roller coaster this energy, right, before the before we started really with this problem. But if we look at this area here, well, let's look at this place. That has to equal the gravitational potential energy at that point and the spring potential energy at that point and the kinetic energy at that point and any work that left the system at this point. So we're at the lowest point. So gravitational potential energy is zero. Still no spring in this situation. It is moving now. There is a speed, so there's kinetic energy. And the roller coaster is not doing any work. And I know it's not doing any work because it's not pushing on anything and making something move, right? There's nothing in its way that it has to push out of its way. So I could say that. And this goes with the same, the, the same equation as last time, right? So if I take two times kinetic energy divided by the mass, take the square root, that is my speed. So two times six one two five zero kilogram meter squared per second squared divided by the mass of two hundred and fifty kilograms. And we take the square root. Now before I do this, let's just do some uh, actually I'll get the number. I'll get the number and then we'll we'll talk about this stuff before we move on. All right, times two divided by 250, take the square root of the answer, <clears throat> works out to be 22.13. And then let's see, kilograms cancel out. Square root of meters squared is meters. Square root of seconds squared is seconds. 22.13 meters per second. All right, so let's take a look here. Kind of erase a little bit of this so I could write some stuff here. I'm at my lowest point. So my gravitational potential energy was zero. The only type of energy that we had was kinetic energy. So how much kinetic energy do we have? Six, one, two, five, zero joules. And how fast must it be going? 22.13 meters per second. So I figured out everything for this moment in time, right? When it reaches this lowest hill, it brought it up to a height of 25 meters and we let it roll back down all the way to the ground or to that lowest point. And this is how much speed it must have picked up. So we can get the energy levels because we understand the situation and we understand conservation of energy, right? And then we can go ahead and we can calculate the speed. Now, one other thing I want to point out, when I got the number, I multiplied by 250. When I went and solved speed, I divided my number by 250. <clears throat> and the reason why I'm saying this is if we write it out slightly different and we just look at these two things, then what we're saying is MGH equals one half MV squared, right? And I'm doing it a long way around to get to this, right? But 
the 61,250 is because I multiplied MGH together, right? And then that equaled the kinetic energy, which is one half MV squared. So if I kind of want to do it in shorthand, that's what they're equal to. And if I notice that and I divide by mass, regardless of what the mass is, <coughs> it doesn't matter for this speed. If this object falls 25 meters, it will have a speed of 22.13 meters per second. That's what it's telling us. So this roller coaster, like many things, is really mass independent, right? And that's good for us because if we had a roller coaster, we're, we can't be like, okay, it's filled with a lot of people this time, so it's going to be going these speeds at different points, but next time it's almost empty or the people are just lighter, and now it's going to go different speeds. No, that's absolutely not true. It doesn't matter who's in the roller coaster. It doesn't matter if it has anyone in it and it's just running empty or it's completely filled, right? It's going to reach the same speeds at the same locations which is a really convenient thing when we're dealing with situations like this, things going uphills and downhills, right? That the, the, the mass of, of what's moving doesn't matter so much. It's gonna reach the same speeds at the same times. Now, when I wanna figure out like how much work was done by the motor that brought it up here, well, there the mass does matter. An empty roller coaster is gonna be easier, require less force to get it to the top of the hill. A full one's gonna require more force. So if I'm just looking at like the work that was done here, the work in, well, the mass makes a difference. But once we get to that top of the hill and we just have gravitational and kinetic energies, well, it doesn't matter so much, right? It matters for getting the actual amount of kinetic energy. But when I start looking at just heights and speeds, well, I can cancel out the mass. All right, so <clears throat> let's take some of this information forward. It goes up a second hill. And let's just say for the sake of argument, the speed at the second hill is eight meters per second. Now we can answer these other questions. What's the gravitational potential? What's the kinetic energy? What's the height of this second hill if it achieves a speed of eight meters per second? And again, the mass doesn't really matter. I could do this without the mass, but, uh, but we have it. So let's see, I'm gonna get rid of a bunch of stuff here. I'm gonna rewrite that a little bit. 61,250. And let's just put this number on top, right? So the total energy is 61,250. And now we're looking at a different situation on this track, right? We're looking at here at the end. And again, gravitational potential energy at that point, a spring potential energy at that point, plus kinetic energy, plus work out. And I know what that's got to equal. That's got to equal the total energy, right? It's got to equal the total energy because that's conservation of energy. Well, we're on the second hill. We have a height because we went up, right? We, we're, we're on a hill. So I know there's gravitational potential energy. Still no spring involved, no spring in this situation. Is there kinetic energy? Yeah, there's kinetic energy because it's moving. And it's not gaining or losing energy through work. There's nothing pushing on it anymore, and it's not pushing anything out of its way. So this is my equation now. And these two things combine to add up to 61,250 joules, right? So that's what I have right now is at this moment that I've marked in red, the gravitational potential energy plus the kinetic energy together add up to 61,250, which hopefully makes sense. The kinetic energy is going to go down because we slow down and the gravitational potential is going to go up because we're going up a hill. We're gaining height. So as one goes down, the other one goes up and they work out and they have to be the same thing, right? So what can I do here? Well, I have a mass, I have a speed. So let's figure out the kinetic energy first. One half times 250 kilograms times speed squared, uh, eight meters per second times eight meters per second. And just to make it clear, I'm using the kinetic energy equation, which is one half mv squared. Well, I'm gonna get kilograms meter squared per second squared, which is the same as a joule. <clears throat> so I have one half times 250 times eight times eight. How many joules do we have? We have 8,000 joules of energy or 8,000 kilogram meter squared per second squared. So I can fill that in. I've got 8,000. And that works out well. So I know these two have to add up to 62,000 
I'm sorry, 61,250. So what is this? This is 8,000 joules. The kinetic energy is 8,000 joules. So what do I add to 8,000 joules to get 61,250? That will tell me how much gravitational potential energy we have. So there must be 53,000 250 joules of gravitational potential energy because these two have to add up to the total of that. Okay, so I calculated how much kinetic energy I have using its equation. Then I use my conservation of energy knowledge to figure out how much gravitational potential energy I have. And then I use that and I could solve for the height. So <clears throat> solving for the height, well, I think we just did this. Um, Last problem, but let's do it again. Gravitational potential energy equals mgh, and now I'm looking for the height. So I'm going to divide both sides by mg. My height equals gravitational potential energy divided by mass divided by g. So it is going to be 53250. A joule is a kilogram meter squared per second squared. Try to squeeze it all in here. Divided by 250 kilograms. Uh, then divided by 9.8 meters per second squared. Um, kilograms are going to cancel out. Second squares are going to cancel out. And meters going to cancel out one of them. All right, so let's see. I have a bunch of numbers. I'm going to erase some of this so you can see that unit analysis. Let's just rewrite that again real quick. All right, there we go. So I moved it over so we could see it better. Now when I look at my unit analysis, let's see, second squared cancels out second squared of a kilogram and a kilogram of a meter on the bottom, which cancels out one of the meters on top. So my units are going to be meters, which makes sense because it's a height. So that tells me I'm also expecting a number less than 25 because I couldn't go above 25 because that was kind of my starting point. <coughs> so I must be reaching a speed less than that. Works out to be well. Here I would be at a height of 21.7 meters, which looks like it works out okay to me. I didn't reach 25, right? So when I look at this stuff, it makes sense. The number of the units work out. Just my understanding of the situation absolutely works out. So let's ask one more question in this problem. I'm going to get rid of a whole bunch of this stuff. I have all the numbers I need. I filled in my chart. All right, so let's say for the sake of argument, we have unique way stopping this roller coaster, right? And let's say that we put a block here, and this block has a mass of, let's say, 50 kilograms. And there's friction there. We're going to use the friction of the block to stop it because the roller coaster rolls, rolls pretty smoothly. Right? And we're going to say that mu for this block is 0.5. 0.5. All right, so then we ask the question, how far, let's change my color, how far does this box get pushed as it brings the roller coaster to a stop, right? The roller coaster is going to hit the box, it's going to push it, and it's just going to slide along the surface, and the friction is going to cause everything to come to a stop. So how far would this block have to get pushed in order to do this, which is going to be a completely you know, unrealistic number for roller coasters, but that's okay, right? And then in the end, if we think about it more for conservation energy, it's going to lose energy, right? The roller coaster car is going to lose energy because it's doing work on the box. And that energy doesn't really disappear. It gives it to the box, but then the box quickly turns it into heat, right? And if we think about it, if it was dragging along the ground, it would just get so hot, right? And the thing would probably get incredibly hot. But what do we have for this situation? Well, again, we can look at it. Gravitational potential energy plus spring potential energy plus kinetic energy plus work out. And that's going to equal, well, that's going to equal the total energy of 61,250 joules now, right? <clears throat> well, does it have gravitational potential energy when it comes to a stop? It looks like it. There's still a height, and I even know the height, and I even know how much gravitational potential energy I have, assuming that this path stays horizontal. Still no springs. This box is not a spring. It's not going to flex and spring back. It's just going to move along. And when it's done pushing this, there'll be no kinetic energy. This box is going to bring it to the stop. 
So this roller coaster is going to give away some of its energy in the form of work. That's what it's going to do. So five, three, two, five, zero. That's how many joules of gravitational potential energy it has. So we didn't get rid of a lot of energy. When I say get rid of, right, this kinetic energy that we have um, is really what's going to turn into work. But if we write it out this way, then we could see, okay, well, the work that you take away from the roller coaster in order to stop it must have been 8,000 joules. And that makes sense because what does work for us? Well, kinetic energy does work for us. So how much work can be done? Well, it's equal to the kinetic energy pretty much. <clears throat> and let's see, let's go back to forces. So we have a 50 kilogram, we have a 50 kilogram box. So the weight of that box must be 490 newtons, right? The gravitational force of that box, which means the normal force of that box must be 490 newtons, which means that the kinetic friction is mu times the normal force, 245 newtons. So it's 245 newtons is the force trying to stop this whole situation. Newton's third law says that you apply force on an object applies an equal force back. So if the friction pushing on the roller coaster is 245 newtons, well, then the roller coaster is pushing on the box with a force of 45 newtons. So the workout equals force times displacement. I know how much work is, is, is there. <clears throat> 8,000 newtons because all the kinetic energy turns into work as it comes to a stop. And I know the force, the force is 245 newtons. So I'm looking for how far will the block get pushed. So work out divided by the force is gonna equal the displacement. And let's again, put everything in its base unit. So it's gonna be 8,000 kilogram meter squared per second squared. And we're gonna divide by a force of 245 newtons. Well, what's a newton? A newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. And then as I look at this, seconds squared, or just all seconds cancel out, kilograms cancel out. I have a meter on the bottom. I get rid of one on the top. And again, I'm gonna have an answer in meters, which is good because I'm trying to measure a distance. What's the distance it's gonna be pushed? So it's gonna be 8,000. 8,000 divided by 245, how far would this get pushed? This would get pushed 32.65, so we'll call it 32.7 meters, right? Which is mainly why we don't stop roller coasters this way, right? Um, but we'd have to push it that way because that's the force we would be exerting the entire time, which means that's the distance it would have to travel in order to get rid of all 8,000 newtons of sorry, 8,000 joules of kinetic energy, right? Other ways to do this, we could make it roll up a hill, right? And then we could stop it as it reaches the top of the hill. Some roller coasters do that nowadays, right? They start at a high hill, they go do some loops some flips, whatever they do. And then they go up a second hill and they just wait there for a minute, right? And then, then there might be a motor that brings it up to a higher point. So it has more energy and it goes back backwards through the whole thing, right? Because in the real world, not all the energy, right? Conservation of energy is always true, right? So it's not, what I'm saying is that we're violating conservation of energy. But I am saying in the real world with a roller coaster, what other forms of energy are created? Well, some sounds created, it's gonna be tiny amounts, but still it's there. So some of that 61,250 would turn into sound. Some of that 61,250 will turn into heat because there's probably friction at different parts of the track as it goes through. I'm sure there's places where it rubs um, and some of the energy is lost and heat's created, right? So we won't have all the energy um, to do these things. But if you have a good roller coaster, these numbers work out pretty well, right? There's not going to be a lot of energy loss in these other forms because they're made to minimize friction. They're made to minimize sound and all these things. Um, so, so these numbers hold true. All right, there is two problems, one kind of short and this other one kind of long where we look at um, what happens, but the process stays the same regardless of the type of problem. What types, type or types of energy do you have initially? And that's got to equal the total energy, which doesn't change. So that equals the type or types of energy at every other spot, right? The total energy doesn't change. We just have to figure out, is that total energy being shared between different types of energy or is it just one type of energy, right? In different moments in this problem and the last problem, you know, 
there's different situations. That's really what you got to understand. Okay. Have a good day.